recording it. Welcome to part 11 of People Are Complicated. We are in 2 Samuel 5, uh, the first 16 verses. So I will read this text and we'll start with just what stands out to you. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in, brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed King David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, <clears throat> who said to David, You will not come in here. Even the blind and the lame will turn you back, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. David said on that day, Whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, those whom David hates. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with the cedar tree, along with cedar trees and carpenters and masons who built David a house. David then perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. In Jerusalem, after he came from Hebron, David took more concubines and wives, and more sons and daughters were born to David. These are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphet. All right, what stands out to you? What do you notice? One of the better names be so. <laughs> wow. It astonishes me that it isn't until verse 12. That David then perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. Cool. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a lot. <laughs> we didn't get that. Well, I don't know what it means. The more positively, it's the patience mm -hmm. of David. Mm -hmm. I, I, and, and, and I think maybe that verse is saying, okay, now I see that it's rightfully mine, but I did not seize it. Mm -hmm. We've seen that patience all the way through these stories. Mm -hmm. David's doing well, but the turning point is coming very quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a lot of that, you know, a lot of that has to do with patience and running other patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, speaking for myself, patience is something I have to keep working on. Mm -hmm. By forcing things rather than right. waiting and let them unfold. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, verse one, look, we are your bone and flesh. Mm -hmm. um, there's the African concept of Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. -U mm -hmm. I am because we are, and I get that from that. Oh, yeah. A sense of belonging. Yeah. Jane. Please, uh, go ahead, Jane, please. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were going to say something, Jane. I got I got nothing. Somebody somebody <laughs> somebody spoke up earlier. Who was that? No, that Mark. was me. And, and okay, go ahead. Mark. 
this might be a little off topic, but you know, listen, I have to bring it up, and and I see it, uh, you know, at times in 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 scripture, and I, I'm not in favor of concubines and wives, and I I just don't know at what point was that decided that that wasn't you know true and necessary. I mean, it is. There's often times where figures have multiple wives, and maybe maybe it's important to have twenty children. But I just I and, and so that violates me when I see that, mm -hmm. and so I just want to just uh, yeah you know, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's supposed to. I, I mean, I think there's sort of a drumbeat there that's saying, that, in fact, it's that verse that reminds me trouble's coming. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, I've got the text down here somewhere. Um, Deuteronomy 17, when you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set over you a king when the Lord your God will choose. And he must not acquire many wives for himself, or his heart will turn away. So I'm, I'm, glad, that, I'm glad that was corrected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it also made me think like like father like son, you know, with mm -hmm. Solomon and all everything we did, yeah. all the different wives and concubines. Yeah. 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 It seems like it's certainly the life of a powerful person that these kinds of things are t more tolerated. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And certainly it was part of the, the culture for a, a, a king to do that. So mm -hmm. sort of could capitulation of the culture uh so just some some things i initially noted um so this is page 56 at the top uh, saul has the royal position as king and it's david who, who's, who's really been leading the, the people that's what the elders seem to be saying to david at the beginning of verse two uh, just interesting in verses six through seven, the, the high confidence that the Jebusites had, you know, no one's going to take this place. And then at, at least the way the narrative is written, you know, David swoops right in and seem to have much, much trouble taking it. <laughs> uh, verses six through eight, and we'll talk about this, the, the, the threefold uh, use of the phrase, the lame and the blind, uh, all of which seems really negative um and then and then his art has has noticed the taking of concubines and wives um okay. in the the phrase there at the beginning it's not verse five it's it's verse one look we are your bone and your flesh somewhat reminiscent of genesis 223 this at last adam says is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh so it's just interesting language uh, chosen chosen by the, the elders. Okay, <laughs> let's let's jump into it. Uh, the first five verses. So some commentary. Um, a, a general statement here. Second Samuel five through ten essentially uh, presents the apex of David's career. Here, David conquers Jerusalem, the crown jewel of the promised land establishes an effective administrative system, leads Israel to victory over all their enemies. David's virtue is showcased as he fulfills his commitment to Jonathan by caring for his fallen comrade's only son, Mephibosheth, and most significantly in a passage that has made major implications for the Christian community, the Lord establishes an eternal covenant with David's family line. So this, this is the, the very top of that, that arc in, in the story of David. Uh, letter B, credible opposition to David's claimed kingship over all, his, all Israel died with Abner and Ishbosheth. So since last Wednesday, uh, that's that's what's what's happening. Abner and, and Ishbosheth are now out of picture. And so uh, making David Israel's next monarch is Israel's only rational alter alternative. Brueggemann uh, makes an interesting comment about the 
flesh and bone. The formula of flesh and bone is probably not a statement about biological kinship, but it recognizes that the two parties have long stood together in strength, bone, and weakness, flesh. Uh, it's so interesting. You know, hey, we've been together through thick and thin, David. So it makes sense for us to come together here. And then <laughs> Brueggemann, again, noticing the language in verse two, while Saul was king, it was you. And that the Hebrew is emphatic. You, it was you who in fact did the thing that, that the king was supposed to do. So Saul, Saul has the title and the position, but it's David who's actually doing the, the work, the leading there. Uh, which which leads me to ask, has, has there ever been a time when you were the one doing the actual work in an organization when someone else was wearing their title, <laughs> the position? Never happened to me. Maybe I can wave the word. Yeah. They do the work and, and the boss makes the work. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, um, a, a whiskey. Uh, I have a point to make um, <laughs> called Uncle Nearest. And Uncle Nearest uh, was the formerly enslaved man who created the Jack Daniels recipe. Mm -hmm. And Jack Daniel got all the credit. Mm -hmm. And a woman from California found out the history, went to where Uncle Nearest lived, bought the property, and got permission from Jack Daniel to create Uncle Nearest whiskey from his old recipes. Is that right? So wow. that's I have a bottle at home if you want to go. <laughs> it's in stores. Huh? What time? Next Wednesday. It's um think I, I think it's better than Jack Daniels, actually. <laughs> Quite a story. I think it's like the brain manager, right? Like manager gets the credit in like yeah, you have a leadership meeting, right? Like you're not allowed there, but your manager is, right. and they're like, "Yeah, we've done this and this and this," yeah. but they didn't do any work. It's all the people under them that did all the work. Yeah, yeah. But they got the, you know, got to say it. Right. Yeah. And sometimes they can't even really talk about what the work mm -hmm. was exactly yeah. Yeah. because they don't know. Yeah. 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 Like yeah, they tell you to put PowerPoint together. So right. you, yeah. <laughs> you guys are hitting a little too close to the owners of the of an engineering company. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> I see and I. So yeah, it, it it feels like an interesting comment by the elders that they they recognize David's proven himself, right? He, he may not have had the the crown or the throne, but he's 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 proven himself as a leader. Um, let's look at the, the titles that they use to talk about David here. So the bottom, this is the bottom page 56, letter F. Israel's elders were aware of a word from the Lord revealing that David would shepherd my people Israel. The text of the prophecy avoided calling David Israel's king. Instead, it termed him a ruler, or some translations will say prince there. A term previously used to refer to Saul and his role as Israel's divinely appointed leader. <coughs> the Lord's words must have been reassuring to the elders of Israel. First of all, the oracle affirmed that Israel was the Lord's possession. My people, no earthly king could own them. Second, it stated that David's assigned role was that of shepherd. That is one appointed to defend, lead, and tend to the needs of those for whom he's, he's responsible. The king is shepherd image has paternalistic overtones. Shepherds are responsible for the sheep, not sheep for the shepherd. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Brugman picks this up. The metaphor of shepherd and sheep introduces an entire theory of governance and power. That theory receives its most remarkable embodiment in the location of Jesus, who is the good shepherd, whose mm -hmm. death is interpreted as a complete sacrifice for the shepherd of the sheep. In their appeal to David, the elders use a second phrase, again, allegedly quoting Yahweh, you shall be prince over Israel. The precise meaning of the term prince is much disputed. At the least, it is a, a word used to avoid the title king. Two reasons for such an avoidance are likely. 
First, to call David Prince leaves room for the kingship of Yahweh. And second, the elders apparently do not want to over-legitimate or excessively exalt David in office. Um, so what, what might we learn about leadership and power through the two terms that are used to describe David, shepherd and prince? What, what, do, you, what do you think we learn about leadership and power? Well, before I go there, I just have to comment that the whole, that first sentence, the metaphor that he puts this together out of shepherd and sheep, the metaphor of shepherd and sheep introduces an entire theory of governance and power. I mean, that is mostly what he writes about, but hmm. um, to draw such implications, just a flock of sheep and a shepherd um, blows my mind. Um, hmm. And yet, I think there's some legitimacy to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. But it people... almost seems like overreach to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, I understand. And uh, it feels like you know, he's picking up a thread that, that we sort of pull and, and find throughout, throughout scripture here. But why why these two terms? What what do you think the the, the narrator is trying to say about? Them? I think shepherd and prince both do the work, whereas king gives orders. Oh. But uh, you know, I feel like you never see prince you know all the time just sitting in the place like they're mostly out you know learning things whether it's you know through politics or being in a war field or whatever. Mm -hmm. And same with shepherds like shepherd is never at home while sheep is out you know so. Okay. Um, I think it's like it just describes that with the king, mm. it's like you just sit there and you let your subjects do the work, mm. you know. Mm. Um, so that's what came up. To <laughs> that's good. It, it seems pretty consistent with the idea that um, God really didn't want to give them a king. You know, he wanted to be the king. Mm. And so they don't, you know, that language is not ascribed to David, even though it is ascribed to David. But um it seems like it's consistent with that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The story is being told in, in such a way that it's it it's it, it feels like it's a, it's attempting to leave room for God as King. Mm -hmm. I like the comment just above the Bergman the Bergman quote ends with that shepherds are responsible for sheep. The sheep are not responsible for the shepherd, mm. which is um, quite different idea than Prince. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does stand out more with that shepherd image. Yeah. I also think it introduces. Um, the concept of shepherd and prince, those certainly are your first introduction, unless they're earlier than that, of this concept, what, of course, Isaiah talks about in terms of the Christ who is to come. Yeah. You know, talks about the prince of peace and the good shepherd. And, you know, so it's, it's and of course, the lineage from David. So it seems like it's starting, mm -hmm. it's almost a prophecy, in a way, mm -hmm. of making a connection. Um, yeah, that's a good insight. Yeah. That makes me question. I wonder when Psalms 23 was written <laughs> in relationship to this. Because mm -hmm. there's certainly that mm -hmm. um, you know, God being our shepherd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but we won't know that, will we? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, letter G, for, for these reasons and perhaps more, all the elders of Israel journeyed to David's capital city of Hebron to install him as their new king. There in the city of his royal residence, David made a compact or cut a covenant with these official representatives of all the tribes. The ceremony was carried out before the Lord, suggesting the ceremony was as religious in nature as it was political. Uh, so, 
um, you know, back in 1 Samuel 16, when when Samuel anoints David, it's private and religious. Then uh, last week we see David anoint king over Judah, and it's public, uh, but but largely it feels kind of secular. And and now David's here appointed king over all of Israel, and it's public, and and it seems to be very religious here, very spiritual. It's it's a it's a covenant. It's done before the Lord. Um, and and so you you've got spirituality and and um, politics here coming together in in the anointing of David. Um, what role did faith and spirituality play in David's appointment as king, and what role should they play when it comes to the appointing of leaders uh, today? And how how do you parse that out? I guess it was evident that for people when they saw David that God was with him. So I think like today, you know, if you were to choose uh, same concept, the spiritual leader should, you can, she should be able to easily tell that God is with them in a sense, like, you know, they are spiritual, they are um, all the qualification that would make them a good spiritual leader mm -hmm. should be visible. It shouldn't be hidden, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. So that's working too. Yeah, so there might be some qualities, yeah, that, characteristics that we would look for. There's as... no self appointment, you know, right. like a lot of yeah. times, like, yeah, yeah, and I'm choosing to appoint myself. But yes, the yeah. king, you know, he didn't go that route, right? People came to him and be like, okay, mm -hmm. we can clearly see, yeah, it's been you, <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty good contrast, yeah. I think there's, <clears throat> I think there's an unself consciousness on David's part that um, uh, I think he just wanted to do what he thought was right for God. He believed it. And I don't think it was showing off. Um, but there's an unselfconsciousness about it. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, there was something in him that he felt compelled to follow. Um I don't know how much that plays in. I think it's consistent with him not, quote, uh, grabbing the kingship. It came to him mm -hmm. versus him grabbing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When you, have, when you ask about the application today, I mean, I really believe in the Bill of Rights. I really believe in the First Amendment. Having said that, I'd like to see more faith in government within government mm -hmm. and less politics in church. Well, oh, okay, that's yeah. the the. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't. I you know, I think we went astray when we when we turned the First Amendment into separation of church and state, mm -hmm. which I don't think it was saying that. It was saying you can't impose an established religion on the people. You know, mm -hmm. you can't legislate religion, um, but um, but you know you you you'd like to see spirituality honored in political leaders, mm -hmm. and and that they're not sort of uh, reluctant to show it. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I was. Every time a president, you know, a president or some other leader has, you know, broke into amazing grace in a in a service. Good. Good. That's great to see a president of the United States doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But but I don't, you know, I I I, I don't like churches that major major in I don't mind the majoring in justice mm -hmm. but but not in politics mm -hmm. I mean stick to the truth and and advocate for <clears throat> the poor and advocate against discrimination but uh, um, but it's ugly mm -hmm. um, when it becomes a major when politics becomes the issue in church. And there's a distinction. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, I, 
I've run into in my life than the notion that you say anything that is in the headlines anywhere. Well, that's politics. Mm -hmm. Well, the headlines often are about real life and, mm -hmm. and the church has to be able to address <clears throat> those. But there's a real distinction that you do not cross into, into politicizing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think our minds are so skewed that um, the people that we elect as our leaders reflect who we are. And if they are messed up, then it starts with us because we're the people that put them there. Okay. <laughs> but it, it's the truth. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we have a, a quote unquote separation of church and state, which I think is a very interesting concept, but there are people in 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 you know working the state, you know, working for the state, they are the state, and you can't really separate the two. Um because they're people, you know, you can't compartmentalize all these things because right. people are acting on their own views, and their own feelings, and how they were raised, and, and and all of that. So if you are a person who doesn't believe that people should be helped or not interested in justice, but making sure that you know your particular race isn't annihilated or replaced or something, you're going to elect people that you know mimic that, that 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 parrot that 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 amplify that. Um, if we want to change the country, we have to start with ourselves. We have to, and it, it has to be organic from the roots and whatever those roots are, they will flower later on in Washington, in city hall or wherever, wherever. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the mission of the church <laughs> to change the culture from the beginning and not the other side. Cause it's too late up there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too late at the end of the fruits. You got to get to the roots. So that's why I'm running for state senate. <laughs> <laughs> to change the fruits at the roots. <laughs> Oranges. I spent some time last week, mostly in relation to that Sunday morning class that we just finished, reading a document that came out of Germany, I think in 1934. Dale, you may have to help me a little bit. Um, called the Barman Confession, and it was an effort of the churches in Germany to say, I think, much of, of what Dale was saying and Eddie in the face of what was happening amongst them at the time. And it, you know, it is a blending. I mean, it's an interesting document if anybody's got patience mm -hmm. to read it. Um, and then 30 years, 35, 40 years later, there was this, uh, another movement in South Africa that prompted the, uh, the churches there to articulate um, a similar statement regarding church and state and the relationship between church and state. And, and those both assume that there is a relationship. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair statement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, so there's some significant historical uh, documents that, that really, really touch on this issue and, and show ways in which people try to think through this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a funny concept because we, we, we say that we believe in that, but you know, look at our pledge of allegiance. Look at our money. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> look at look yeah. at the Supreme Court with Moses. You know, so um, yeah, it's it's it, yeah, it's a tension. It is a tension. It's a yeah. tension. Yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Um, let's uh, David. Let's move on to David taking Jerusalem, um, verses six through ten. So the bottom of page fifty-seven. David's first act as king of Israel was to select a new royal capital for the United Kingdom, over which he now reigned. As a battle-tested military strategist, he wanted a place. Excuse me. I'm oh, sorry. He wanted a place that was centrally located and easily defensible. As a Saudi politician, he wanted a place that belonged to none of the twelve tribes. The capital was to be regarded as an island of national identity and a sea of tribal rivalries. So. Yet once again, we see some of the real 
wisdom and strategic thinking of David here. Uh, the king and his men, this, this is where David takes his men. Dave, the king and his men suggest that David took the relatively small army which had supported him in his fugitive days. Loyal and resourceful, they could be depended upon to lie with each other in achieving the impossible. I, I think that's that's interesting. We, we won't stop and talk about that, but you know, sort of that smaller is better thing. There are times when smaller is indeed better. Um, so the top of page 58, the Jebusites were one of the minority peoples of Canaan, frequently mentioned in connection with Jerusalem, which was also known as Jebus, Judges 19. Uh, the phrase, the inhabitants of the land, would be tra better translated of the area, the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusite defenders of the city considered themselves impregnable. You will not come in here. The wedge-shaped site consisted of a ridge rising to the north with a slope on the west toward the Tyro uh, Phoenician Valley, and an even steeper and longer slope down the eastern side of the Kidron. A city wall of heavy stones protected the citadel, and from the top, stones could easily be rained down on attackers, even by the blind and the lame. Uh, as we might say, it was child's play. The phrase, the city of David, is in use today in connection with the archaeological excavations on the southeastern hill of Jerusalem, south of the Temple Mount, this was the area previously known as the Stronghold of Zion, uh, perhaps meaning eminence, not to be confused with modern Mount Zion, which was further west. The Jebusite city was a fortified area encircling the citadel, whose water supply was the spring of Pihon near the base of the eastern slope. Uh, having entered the city by some uh, surreptitious means, David's men were to deal with his enemies, who are described in terms used by the Jebusites of the defenders of their city, who are hated by David's soul, needs to be understood in context, and is better translated to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. Uh, and then Brueggemann's sort of summary here, the details of the conquest of Jerusalem are exceedingly obscure. First, the meaning of the term in verse eight, which the RSV renders water shaft, is obscure. Uh, the water shaft reading follows a well-established tradition suggesting either that David's men invaded the city through the water tunnel, which was the city's only vulnerable point, or that they controlled the water supply and thus forced surrender. Second, the references to the blind and the lame in verses 6 through 8 are problematic. The reference to the blind and lame in verse 6 may suggest that Jerusalem is so easily defended that even the disabled can guard it. On that basis, the end of verse 6 is a taunt against David. In verse 8a, it is said that David hates blind and the lame, perhaps because they taunted David. And finally, in the latter part of verse 8, these statements result in a programmatic expulsion of blind and lame from the city, and perhaps later from the temple. At least that's, that's one way of reading it. In much of the church, this odd text is included in the lectionary as a foil for the new Jerusalem evoked by the gospel. In the old Jerusalem of this text, the blind and the lame are excluded and despised. In the new Jerusalem envisioned by the gospel, all are welcome and the blind and lame are transfer, transformed into full welcome participants. So this phrase, uh, blind and lame, it's used, it, it seems like it's, it's either used here as a metaphor for the, the people that are lowest in society, or it's, it's used literally, like literal blind and lame people are defending the city um, and being hated by David and being excluded uh, from something, the city, the temple, something. Um, it, it, I'm not sure how to interpret any of this except negatively, no matter, no matter how you uh, wrestle with it. It all seems fairly negative. Um, so, so my question is, what do you make of this? What, what, do, you, what do you make of this? What, what's the story saying about the blind Malay? Art. <laughs> you muted. Julie muted you. 
<laughs> no, go, go ahead, Annie. I see, you, I see you, you're trying to get in there. Okay, go ahead, Art. You were first. No problem. Um, listen, my only comment is is that the blind and the lame, and these, these are not my thoughts, they're expendable. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That, that well, feels true, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Annie. The, the blind and the lame, they 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 were powerless, right? They had no power. They were they were despised partly because they were essentially, you know, for humanity for, for that those people, they were useless. They were only there, they only had to be helped. They couldn't help. They couldn't um so they they show they showed the weakness, you know, the weakness of man. They showed what what didn't want to be. They were the antithesis of power, right? They were the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. So, I think um, to to exclude them makes sort of that knee jerk sense. You you know you you don't want to have that. You want you want to have the the strength. You want to have the power. They how how all the all the other talk is of of armies and conquest and kings and reigns and and so all the stuff that's opposite of that we don't even want to deal with that that's not where we are so the fact that there's any discussion of um having them come into the fold and be considered um is revolutionary it's monumental it's um, I mean we we today wouldn't say that but certainly back then it seems like that would be enormous in, an enormous thing to embrace or even consider I might be really mixed up here but where does Mephibosheth fit into all of this he was in David's line was he grandson to him no Saul's line Saul's line right Jonathan but David for he and he, yeah, but he's, he's like lame that. and he's protected, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, whatever okay. Dave is doing or saying here, later on, he he he, he certainly takes in mm -hmm. someone who's lame. He, he's and not a kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. John. 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 Okay. Now there there is a there is a a, a very old um, Jewish. Uh, uh, interpretation uh, that, that suggests that uh, it, it, in ancient Jerusalem there were there were these two statues of um, Isaac and Jacob, I think, and and one was blind and one was lame, and it was, it was sort of mocking uh, the Jewish faith, and and that 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 that's what's going on here. Um, and some some interpreters sort of uh, run with that. I don't know what to make of that. But, yeah. it, it, but you know, what's the lesson that Charles has been teaching around other even in that the history of um, Hitler's Nazis mm -hmm. is kind of like they're weak, they're poor. Let's mm -hmm. just get rid of them. They're yeah. they don't project yeah. the strength. Yeah. We want to yeah, be so let's just get rid of them. You're a drain on the economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which if you know if so if that's if that is indeed the case, it's it's really a uh, it's, a, it's it's uncomfortable founding here of, of or or at least capturing of Jerusalem and, and it's the its central role in the story of the people of God beginning perhaps in some way with with you know the, the denigrating of of uh, some of the people that are least in a society, mm -hmm. you know, it just feels like, well, well it's a tough start. Well, well, I mean, it's a cliche now, sort of, but I mean, it's another ex example of this whole situation is complicated. Yeah, yeah. And everything in the story, um, I mean, it shows up over and over. What yeah. is going on there? Yeah. And these are not exactly the people I want to my moral <laughs> insights from yeah yeah i mean you have to, to love debbie's point about Methuselah being you know eating yes. the table of the king so there were some exceptions clearly <laughs> yeah right this is this is one one page in a larger story and yeah right um 
Okay, let's let's uh, let's move on here just uh, quickly here. So you get this. This is top page fifty nine. You have the strange, at least in the in RSV reference to the Milo or the Milo or yeah, uh, okay. your dog. Um, <laughs> translation of a Hebrew word, the meaning which is probably supporting terraces. The Jebusite, Jebusite city walls were built on the slopes of the hill, which was particularly steep on the west side. Hence, the need to have secure buttresses resting on terraces, which would not slide downwards toward the valley. Even within the city, there was more leveling in order to make the building possible. David evidently turned his attention to substructure early in his occupation of Jerusalem. Uh, so I just find it really interesting that one of the first things that David does, having captured the city, is you know to to really pay attention to fortifying it. Um, you know, perhaps so that what what he just did, no one else is going to be able to mm. to do there. But it it also reminds me of you know, sort of that that interior work, that strong interior work that, that we all have to do. Um, ultimately, letter J, David's continuing progress is, is attributed not to his undoubted gifts, but to his spiritual resources. The Lord, the God of hosts was with him. Again and again, we we find the, the story stopping to say, now this, what just happened here is not because David was such a remarkable person. It's because God was with him. Okay, and then the final verses, 11 through 16 here, um, two pointers are included to ways in which David would consolidate his hold on new capital. So he's anointed as king. He takes this new capital. Now what? Two things Two things happen. Hiram, king of Tyre, uh, Tyre, an important port, which already at the time of David had for centuries been trading in the eastern Mediterranean, made friendly overtures to David, who was beginning to win respect beyond Israel's borders. The hinterland of Tyre was noted for its cedars, and the port boasted skilled workers in wood and stone, some of whom were loaned to David. They took a gift of cedar, wood, and constructed the palace in Jerusalem. So you have foreign relations, diplomacy, and, you know, receiving uh, uh, gifts and, and goods from a foreign power. And and then the, the wives and concubines and sons. So again, this, so this is Baldwin. Bottom page 59. If David knew Deuteronomy 17, 17, which says the king must not acquire many wives, uh, he interpreted it in a way that permitted him to keep a harem in the manner of Oriental monarchs. Although, I mean, the text says wives. Of, of the 11 mentioned here, uh, only two uh, reappear uh, sons. Surprisingly, Solomon succeeded as king while his brother Nathan is named as in the genealogy of Joseph, both our sons of Bathsheba. So he's he's acquired the he's acquired the city of Jerusalem. It's the new capital. He, he's he's fixed all the buttresses. He's made it strong and, and huh. secure. And now we have the beginning of relations with foreign powers. And uh, what what kings would have to do, right, is have have as many sons as possible. You got to secure the the line there. Uh, so let, we'll just I'll we'll just kind of open it up there. Um, any other thoughts uh, about this this part of the story? I feel sorry for him. <laughs> Why is that? I, well, that he has to go through all of that. He, you know, I, I'm sorry to say, sounds pretty insecure to me. Tell us more. Well, uh, I, as you say, you know, he, he's successful. But his success needs to be fortified, and and he's not comfortable with his own success, and 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 that he needs to create a legacy. You know, I don't want to go back to the concubines and the wives, and, and and you know, you know, expand his empire and and become even greater. Why why don't, he, why don't he just settle down and recognize what he's got and live with that and be thankful that God has given him that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't we all be better if we could do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I feel sorry for him, Dave, uh, Debbie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah. That, that reality just doesn't exist in that, in that age. True. I it, mean, it's, it doesn't with us either. That's well, the problem yeah, <laughs> with us. You know, because there's always going to be more. There's the, And there's always going to be some, somebody after you. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, I mean, your fate is determined by the stars and by all kinds of different factors that are beyond your control and just as soon as sure as he 
you know, conquered, he could be conquered. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that he does is he notices as he's taken the city, oh, there's a lot of weak spots mm -hmm. in here mm -hmm. to protect what he has. Yeah. And so yeah. there's no there's no risk for the, wick, the wicked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you get to the top, it's, man, it's yeah, a lot you're, of pressure. Your head's head sticking, head, mm -hmm. head sticking straight up. Yeah. It's like a bunch of vice presidents in a company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once again, for the record, Art is against many wives and concubines. <laughs> For the record. Yeah, for the record. Well, you know that house is big enough to hold a lot of wine. <laughs> but not, not for Texas Julie. This town ain't big enough for, <laughs> for the six of us. <laughs> All right. On, on that note, we will uh, stop. So uh, thanks, thanks everybody for being with us. Well, thanks everybody. Good to see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good week.